speaker is Suzanne Barloff. And she's going to tell us about a very different code in the genome. So the, the codon optimality is actually in the protein coding genes. And so, please. Um, oh, thank you for the opportunity to speak here. Uh, so I work as a postdoc, partly in, sorry, that was not that one partly in Michaela Fryer's lab, and partly in the bioinformatics group at the Stem Cell Institute. Uh, so I will start by giving you a little background to the topic, and then I will present our aim and the experiment that we have done, and show you some of the results. Uh, so I assume that you're all familiar with RNA sequencing, so ribosome profiling is a similar technique, but instead of building a library from the whole RNA pool, we subject the RNA to RNA's digestion that will degrade any RNA that is not protected by a ribosome. So those ribosome-protected fragments are then converted into a library and sequenced using high-throughput sequencing. So by mapping those reads to the reference genome, we get a snapshot of the active translation in the cells. So those reads will mark the coding sequence, and they will roughly be correlated to the expression level of the gene. So in addition, this gives us information about how translation happens. So the ribosome will start translating from the start codon, and then it will move along the mRNA until it reaches a stop codon. So if there is a specific codon or some structural feature with the RNA that caused the ribosome to pause, then that will result in an enrichment of reads from that specific position. Uh, so this is very position specific, so if we look at the mapping position of the five prime end of the reads, we can see that they map preferentially at every third nucleotide of the genome. So this is showing mapping position relative to the start site, and this three nucleotide periodicity allows us to, with single codon resolution, see where the ribosome is translating at the moment. So, we used a stem cell model to, of cells exiting pluripotency to answer two questions. First, uh, if codon composition is important for the mRNA abundances, and second, is translation of different codons altered during this differentiation? And by understanding codon usage and codon translation better, this might help us uh, in the basic understanding of gene regulation and development. So we used uh, human pluripotent embryonic stem cells that we induced differentiation by adding rentionic acid. And this was done in four replicates, and the cells were collected either before treatment as self-renewing cells or five days after treatment as differentiating cells. And then we did both RNA-seq and ribosome profiling of those cells. So in addition, we used uh, published data from the Ingolia lab uh, from mouse embryonic stem cells to validate some of our findings. And they used a different differentiation protocol, but again, the self-renewal self state should be similar, and the cells exit pluripotency in both cases. So, after inducing differentiation, the cells undergo massive changes in gene expression. So this is just to give you an overview of the expression changes and how similar they are between the ribosome profiling and the RNA-seq. Uh, so using rather stringent criteria, we identified around 2,000 genes that are differentially expressed in each of these two datasets. And these four groups are the ones that I'm using in the following few slides. So for simplicity, the genes that were higher in the differentiating state is called the diff gene group, and those that were higher in the self-renewing state is called the self group. So we looked at the codon composition of the genes in each of these groups and compared it to the codon composition across all annotated protein coding genes. And what we do see is that there are certain codons that are enriched in the diff gene set, and actually also in the self gene set. So there is a high correlation between these two sets. There are also a group of gene of codons that are depleted in both sets. And this looks very similar if we do the same thing for the RNA-seq data. And if we color this according to the third nucleotide of the codons, we can see that the codons that end with an A or a T 
are depleted in both gene sets, and those with a C are enriched in both gene sets. Um, the one with a G at the third position are a little bit more complicated, so some of them are enriched, but some of them are close to the middle. Uh, and this can actually be explained by the degeneracy of the codon. So codon degeneracy is when you can change the third base and you still encode for the same amino acid. So the fourfold degenerate ones, they are enriched, but the other ones are the ones in the middle. So the third nucleotide is correlated with expression, expression changes following differentiation, and we, was, we were wondering if this is a genomic feature. So to answer this, we did a PCA uh, of visualizing each gene ontology term by representing it by its codon composition of the genes that have that term. So this separates the Go terms by GC content, and if we look at the loadings plot, the separation on the first principal component is very similar to the one that we have across the diagonal. So we believe that this is something that is encoded in the genome and that may be relevant for differentiation. Uh, so we know that the diagonal, this that is similar in the differentiation gene set and the self-renewal gene set is explained by the third nucleotide. But what about the, the difference between the self-renewal and the differentiation gene set? So this would be the distance to the diagonal. Um, and it was actually suggested by the reviewer that we should look at codon optimality. So codon optimality is whether a codon um, contributes to longer or shorter half-life of the mRNA. So we used codon stabilization. This can be measured as codon stabilization coefficient, and we used that, which was calculated by the Bassini Bassini et al. in Zebrafish as the correlation between the mRNA half-life and the frequency of a codon. And they, using experimental validation, divided the codons in five different groups, those that are strongly or weakly stabilizing, those that are neutral, and those that are weakly or strongly destabilizing. And if we color our codons according to this group, we can see that the stabilizing codons are more common in the self-gene set, and the destabilizing codons are more common in the diff gene set, and this is easier to see maybe in the, in the box plot to the right. So in conclusion, we have shown that genes that changed after induced differentiation have a specific codon composition. They are enriched for NNC and fourfold degenerate NNG codons, and they are depleted for NNA and NNT codons. Uh, this seemed to be an inherent feature of the genome that might be related to differentiation. We have also shown that the self-renewing related genes, they have less destabilizing and more stabilizing codon than the differentiation related genes. So this so far could have been done with only the RNA-seq data, so now I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we could do on codon translation using the ribosome profiling data specifically. Uh, so. In the ribosome profiling protocol, uh, the ribosome protects approximately 27 nucleotides from RNA degradation. Those 27 nucleotides correspond to nine codons, and the middle three ones are the EP and the A site in the ribosome. So the A site is where the tRNA enters the ribosome and where we have the codon-anticodon base pairing. The P site is where the tRNA that carry the growing polypeptide chain is sitting, and the E site is where the tRNA is exiting the ribosome. So using this three prime periodicity and this information about having approximately 27 nucleotides, we can calculate the codon occurrence at each of those nine protected positions for each codon. Uh, so using this data, we, can, we calculated the enrichment of a specific codon at a specific position relative to the ribosome versus all other positions. So the ratio between one specific position and all others. Um, so this is shown here for the E, P, and the A site. Uh, and the codons here are sorted according to frequency. So this is the most frequent codon, and this is the least frequent codon. And as expected, maybe, the stop codons, which are colored red, are least frequent and depleted at the P and the A site, which makes sense because if the ribosome had encountered a stop codon, it should have stopped and it should never have moved to the downstream positions. Um, so this is showing the 
code on enrichment across all eight samples that we had, but we can also compare this between the self-renewing and the differentiating samples. So this figure is showing the difference in the codon enrichment between the differentiating and the self-renewing samples for each of the nine positions. We can see that we have most variation at the P and the A site, which makes sense because the A site is where the tRNA entered the ribosome. We have the codon anticodon base pairing, and that's perhaps where regulation happens. And this is also where a new peptide is added to the polypeptide chain. Um, so we notice that in this group of codons that become less frequent after differentiation, a lot of them rely on the same adenine to inosine modification. Uh, so this is just showing the same thing for the P site, where we have colored all those codons that rely on this adenine to an inosine modification in red to show that all of them actually go in the same direction, decrease, and the A site is showing the opposite pattern. Uh, so this is just a reminder. So standard base pairing would be an A to a T or a G to a C using wobble base pairing that would allow a G to base pair with a T at the third position of a codon. But problem with translating the N and C codons is that there are very few copy numbers of even none of some of the tRNA genes that would have the GNN anticodon. So for instance, in this example, we have 35 R genes with the AGC anticodon, but only one with the GGC anticodon. So in order to translate those codons, we need the adenine to inosine modification. So adenine is replaced by an inosine, which can base pair with both T, C, and A, and this allows the translation of this one. So here we have colored those codons that rely on this modification in red. So as you remember, they, they go down of the differentiation at the P site, and they go up at the A site. And we compared it to the mouse data, and especially at the later time point, we can see a similar pattern, particularly at the A site, actually. So it's well known which enzyme is responsible for this modification, and it's the HETADAT enzyme that consists of the ADA2 and the ADA3 subunits. And we verified that this one go down after differentiation, and we also did tRNA sequencing that revealed um, a decrease in the inosine modification levels of the tRNAs after differentiation. So this figure to the left is showing each tRNA separately. And here we have grouped the tRNAs by the tRNA isotype. But you can see that most of them go down. Um, sorry, so from this, we hypothesized that this is actually driven by the codon anticodon base pairing at the A site. So when we have less of this modification, it takes longer for the tRNA to enter the ribosome when it's sitting at those specific codons. And that's why we have an enrichment of those codons in the ribosome profiling data. So in conclusion, we have shown that codon translation is altered during differentiation, and that codons that depend on this adenine to inosine modification at the position 34 in the tRNA anticodon loop are enriched at A site in differentiating cells. And this coincides with a downregulation of the HETADAT enzyme and a reduction of the tRNA modification levels. So, this work would not have been possible, of course, without the funding and the support from the Michaela Freyer Lab and the Bioinformatics Group. And I would like to thank, of course, um, in particular, Michaela Freyer and Sabine Dietman, who is here and here, that contributed to this work, and Tomas Selmi and Sophia Flood that did all of the experimental work. Um, and thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you, fascinating. Uh, there, I think there was some work from uh, Pilpel lab on cancer cell lines, who also showed uh, an association between codon during, I think associated with basically the, uh, the, the growth rates of cells. Is that completely independent to what you see, or is there really some relations? I don't think I have seen that work, so I actually don't know. I think I would have to oh, read it. But yeah, thank you for telling it's, me. It's not fully overlapping. <laughs> 
Hello. So um, I just wonder, I'm curious, like, how fast can ribosomes break on the mRNA highway? So when you do the ribosome profiling, is it, is it possible that you are actually measuring those uh, few nucleotides after uh, when they are, they are supposed to stop? And my second question is, a uh, second comment is, uh, actually, Patini Group published this year human codon optimality values. Did you have a chance to look at that, too? No, I have not seen the second paper yet, but yeah, I will definitely have a look at that. And yeah, the ribosome might move after. Um, so in this protocol, the cells are flash-freezed, and then supposedly the ribos ribosome should stay in that position, but it can also move a little bit, and that would contribute to noise in the data. I mean, that would not give any particular signal, but that's probably why we don't have a perfect tree nucleotide periodicity, but we had approximately 15% or so mapping in the other frames. Okay. Thanks.